Good morning, everybody. It's great to have you all here. Um, I'm Matt Kaharski, and I'm president of Padilla. And welcome to the latest uh, rendition of our POV series. series. This is a, if you haven't been to these before, this is an opportunity for us to bring together really smart people to, to share some point of view on what we see going on out there in the world in strategic communications and branding and helping organizations achieve their purpose through communications. Um, and this has been uh, an exciting one to, to prepare for, um, partly because of uh, it, it's something that you know five years ago I would have never thought we would have done. Uh, back in 2014 um, was the first time Heath and I actually got together at a coffee shop not, not too far from here. Um, Heath was looking for his next gig. Um, we were searching for a new head of creative. And Lynn Casey and I were also in the process of charting what was next for our firm. And uh, we knew that the world was changing. We are moving from this long form, earned media focused communications uh, environment to short form, video, visual, expressing through owned media, through social media and digital. And we knew that at the center of that was going to need to be a much more effective and robust creative capability. But at the same time, I was nervous and, and had some apprehension. And I'll, I'll even say I was sort of, you know, nightmare scary clown nervous about, <laughs> about bringing on a really robust creative capability. Because I think many of you have experienced that stereotypical creative um, team that's, you know, a little bit more hot air and a little bit more about, you know, creative for creative sake and, um, you know, kind of balloons and parades and not really getting anything accomplished other than sort of self-congratulation. And, and I said that to Heath in our, in our coffee and, and of course he started with a response with, mate. <laughs> and then after that we got into a really deep discussion about the, the idea of being purposefully creative and thinking about how creative has to be driven by strategy and and how the business of creative is what's really going to help organizations transform. And, and ultimately, that's why we exist at Padilla, is to help organizations transform. No one's hired us to say, please help us stay exactly the way we are today. And, and, and we knew that we needed to have a great creative capability, a strategic capability to do that. So here we are five years later, having an event on the business of creative, which is pretty cool. Um, and with the help of our friends um, uh, uh, from Lynn Hall and Tim and Zoe, um, we're going to share with you how, create, how creativity and the business of creative permeates everything we do and helps great organizations like these really truly achieve their purpose. So I want to thank you all for being here and I want to thank our panelists. Um, it's weird to call them panelists because they're not just panelists, our friends here for, for helping us. and. I'm looking forward to learning a lot, and I, I hope you are as well. So thanks for being here. And I'll turn it over to my good friend, Heath. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. You got this, right? I got one. Thanks, Mate. Thanks, Mate. Thanks, Mate. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> good morning, everyone, and welcome here to our spring edition of Padilla's POV series. Um, today, we're streaming to you live from the Lynn Hall restaurant. It's beautiful here. If you haven't been here before, those of you in the room, welcome. Um, you'll come back again after you've tasted some of these beautiful treats up the front here. Um, today we're going to be discussing the business of creativity. My name's Heath Ruddock, I'm Chief Creative Officer, as Matt shared with you, of Padilla. And together with my esteemed guests, we're going to talk today about the value of creativity. The value of creativity and what it means to these guys and what it means potentially to your businesses and brands. So my guests today, Zoe Francois. Zoe comes to us um, by way of Instagram, um, <laughs> Zoe Francois is an Instagram maven. She's absolutely amazing. Um, 120,000, 100, what have you got it now? 40. Oh, 140 <laughs> since yesterday. Okay, just a few <laughs> followers um, on Instagram. Her work's been lauded by the New York Times, Food 52, you name it. Who would have thought that um, someone that grew up in a commune is that, is that the polite way we can say it? Someone who grew up with hippies on a commune, um, who didn't have electricity, who didn't have a television screen, his entire life was pretty much hinged on the fact that you need screens to look at Instagram and technology and electricity. So we, what we're going to do today is also hear from Tim. Tim Brunel comes to us with 25 years of big brand experience. He is the um, <coughs> director of content and, and, and a maven of, of production out at Land Lakes Inc. Um, $14 billion industry. What's a $14 billion industry that's known for producing butter 
doing hiring a creative guru? Well, the answer is going to be pretty evident when you when you hear from Tim. Anne Spaeth, um, apart from being a tremendous person and wonderful friend, she has created this incredible place here called the Lynn Hall. She comes to us by way of the law world, the world of law, where she had an incredible career um, advocating for child abused children, <laughs> but decided as life changed that she wanted to do something different and has built an incredible organisation here with what I would call a triple bottom line methodology. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. But first, we're going to hear from Zoe and what she's going to be making for us today. Zoe, Great. what are you going to do for mm. us today? We're going to do something a little different we're making today. Um, <clears throat> I thought it would be appropriate to make a pavlova for an Australian. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. yeah. All the New Zealanders that might be listening in today are going to be texting or tweeting now saying it's actually a New Zealand invention. Yes. But, uh, They'll be all over yeah, Instagram. Yeah, yeah. It's like a Canadian, sure. American <clears throat> thing, Irish, English thing, the pavlova. So, yes. So I'll, I'm going to make a pavlova, but I'm also... Go. There I am. Um, oh. Oh, hang on a second. We've clicked forward. That's fine. It's live. We're streaming live. <laughs> just keep pushing buttons. I'm just going to keep Something pushing buttons. Happen. Before we kick off with that, I've got a little video I'm going to share with you. Um, it's a little bit sort of from my childhood, really, I guess you would say. Um, you're going to wonder why we're sharing this with you. I love this. Physics is my business. To some more experiments in electrostatics. Can I try some? Yes. Uh, what, what do you use that for? Oh, just to have fun with. That's all. You see, why do I work in physics? Because I have fun with it. Very important feature uh, of a man's life. See, just fun. Yeah, why, 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 why do I look at the sky? Because it's pretty. You see, can, can you not make such a device and write a lamp in order to study your history and poetry, right? And so, ladies and gentlemen, and as is our practice, my records to the school and my books to the two young men. I can't get a bit more. You're too many. I know. We need our orchestra. So when I was a little fella, Professor Julius Sumner Miller um, had this program, Why Is It So? And it totally captured my imagination. Unbeknown to me, what began as really an eight-year-old's excuse to watch television in the morning um, became quite an influence in my life. Um, he is sort of the professor of close talking, you might know. <laughs> he gets right in his kids, but it's a little scary in a way. But he really sort of gave, it was a lesson in how to ponder the world. I love how the professor connects the world, words like beauty and intrigue and marvel and elegance to science. These are words that we most commonly associate with art, not science. And science and art are not mutually exclusive. I didn't separate them as a kid. I think some of us still do, certainly our schools do. Do. But over time, the world seemed determined to force me to separate these things. I was forced to bucket these things and categorise them. It seemed determined to sort of really force me to kind of decide whether I was going to be like an art kid or I was a fluffy art kid or I was going to be a serious math kid or a serious science kid. This institutionalised devaluation of creativity and curiosity, um, and the curiosity that fuels it, is, has really been sort of removed from us. Like the schools have really pulled it out of our system. In one of the most watched TED Talks, in fact, um, if, you, if you haven't watched it, you've got to watch this, Ted, uh, this Ken Robinson TED Talk by educationalist Sir Ken Robinson. He claims that schools kill creativity. He argues that we don't grow into creativity, it's <coughs> educated out of us, we grow out of us, or rather we get educated out of it. So I have a little question for us, those of us in the room, and if anyone wants to tweet something, and they can certainly do that. How many of us in this room have heard ourselves apologise for something we've done? I'm going to draw something, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, look, I'm not very creative. I have an idea, but I'm sorry, I'm not very creative. There's an, actually an exercise you can do where you ask people in the room around the desk to draw something and hand it to the person on the left. I guarantee you that person apologises when they give it to you. That to me is such a shame. 
It's such a shame. Being able to draw doesn't make you creative and it's any wonder that today we often struggle to connect the concepts and welcome the value of creativity. So it follows suit then that if we've been educated that way, that our businesses have done a sterling job of perpetuating this same division between creative thinking and serious business, right? Serious business, business that doesn't wear sneakers. But we can flip this by really changing the game and having different discussions around creativity and understanding what creativity looks like. I consider creativity to be a verb rather than a noun and we often see creativity as being a thing. And maybe it's a brochure, maybe it's a thing, maybe it's a particular person in the team. Here's our illustration that you'll see up on the screens right now, uh, an example of uh, something someone might do and, and apologise for it. Really at the end of the day it's a philosophy and here's a challenge though. If you don't think you're creative, perhaps your business is a credit, chances are you're not acting creatively. It's not that you don't do it, it's that you don't choose to do it. It's likely that you're not setting yourself up for success and for the possibility of being creative. So what happens if we take a leap and reset ourselves? What happens, as we see in the illustration here with some statistics, what happens if we reset and start to put some new educations in place? So Robert Epstein, a senior research psychologist at the American Institute of Behavioural Research and Technology, demonstrated here on our screen that after some creative training for employees in a small city in California, 55% more new ideas were presented to the managers. There was a $3.5 million savings demonstrated directly attributed to the education that was, that was presented to the teams. And more importantly, because we always look at the stuff we make, $600,000 in new revenue to the city. That's a lot of money for a city. And this is not an isolated situation. In their June 2017 article, Creative's Bottom Line, McKinsey identify an indisputable correlation between creativity and the financial performance of a business. Creativity is at the heart of business innovation and innovation is the engine of growth. That's the McKinsey organisation. They did some further research and discovered that creativity infused into businesses also delivers 67% above average organic growth. Organic growth is excellent growth because it's cheaper than the other alternative having to get out there. 70% had ab above average total return shareholders. What are we held to so often? Needing to satisfy our shareholders, our stakeholders, the people that are part of our organisations. But even more interesting to me was that 74% had above average net enterprise value. Now I'm not going to get into the EBITDA discussion, but what we're seeing here is that we are literally delivering value to the bottom line of an organisation, whether that's share price, whether that's a sense of value internally within an organisation, because that's a very important part of it also. What I like about this Forrester statistic, was that there was a study done with Forrester and Adobe, when they surveyed um, executives in key markets around the globe, 82% of those companies thought there was a strong correlation between creativity and desired business results. That begs the question, why aren't 82% of these organisations doing super creative, interesting, innovative stuff? It's because I think of the way we've been educated, the way we've spent time at schools, the way we've been scared of getting involved with things. People are scared of getting involved in the kitchen. We'll talk a little bit about people being scared of trying to bake something because they're going to get it wrong. But if you don't, uh, don't want to listen to me, you don't believe this creative guy because we don't really listen to the creative people. We're sort of only, you know, we don't let the truth we're, we're, get... We're tolerated. Well, we don't let the truth get in the way of a great story, you know. <laughs> Why? Um, Why I, did a, I did a quick whip around <laughs> to a few people who we might sort of consider to be experts in their field as well. So Barbara Goose, Chief Marketing Officer at John Hancock. Insight-driven behaviour drives business. So the best insight-based creative strategies drive the best work which drives the best business. I thought John Hancock just did retirement funds, played in money markets. Amanda Brinkman, who many of you will know certainly in this market, Chief Brand and Communications Officer of the Deluxe Corporation, creativity is critical to a company's bottom line. It's vital that companies find creative ways to make a positive impact on the world around them. Um, yeah. Hamid Bambraham, um, only the former head of data science for Fidelity, pretty heavy duty job, chief executive officer of Natural Numerics. 
um, Hamid has actually been part of one of our panels last year around artificial intelligence. Savant smart individual, business says businesses that fail to reinvent themselves do not survive today's increasingly fast changing environment. Creativity is critical for addressing the unknown and inventing the future. Wow, okay. I'm starting to feel more important every one of these quotes that comes out. Norman de Grev. No one can deny that in the world of pharma retail in particular, that CVS has made some huge strides. It was a very strategic, creative stroke of, of genius to uh, decide not to sell cigarettes. Now, I'm sure that had a very big impact on the, on the bottom line of the organisation, but it's had another really positive impact on the position of CVS in the minds of all of us. Creativity creates effectiveness and helps brands stand out in a crowded field, whether it's a bold strategic move, like our cigarette decision, a brand demonstration, an experience or advertising, creativity is what helps brands not compete on price and functionality alone. Uh, Norman is also the individual that uh, made the decree that we will not, as an organisation, Photoshop women to look better in our advertising. And that, again, that was a huge move, a big, bold statement from an organisation. David Kenny, CEO of Nielsen. This guy knows a little bit about what he's, uh, what he's up to. Customers have more choices than ever, which means fresh, better, bolder ideas are needed to keep their attention and loyalty. A sustained investment in creativity and a risk-tolerant culture are both needed to stay relevant in our tech-enabled world. We'll talk a little bit about this concept of a risk-tolerant culture later. It's vital. Because we are scared, we're scared of being in the kitchen, we're scared of putting our hand up to have an idea in a room. And certainly as the leader of a creative team, I often find myself throwing my ideas because I'm trained to do it. I'm trained to deliver the information that I have, the thoughts that I have. I've kind of, I still get nervous. People <coughs> find that funny when I make that statement. I still get nervous and anxious to put up my idea, but I know if I don't do it now, we're going to miss the boat. Now is the opportunity. But that can also cause an issue in teams who aren't trained or aren't used to doing that. So we've also, as creative leaders, as creative people, we've got to understand that it cuts both ways. That I need to be able to welcome ideas to the table. Because as Matt alluded to earlier, some of us are a little, uh, uh, a little boisterous, a little loud. <laughs> uh, get excited about, the, uh, about possibilities. And that can be intimidating for those who have been told that, or, or under the impression, the perception, that their thinking might not be as good as it might be, or certainly as good as the person who's paid to be the creative person. Anyway, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Zoe has been uh, toiling away. <laughs> yeah, it's still looking good. Um, she's making a pavlova for us. Pavlovas are delicious. I think I'm the only Australian that doesn't actually really eat pavlova. <laughs> You but will. there is a lot of We're tension between. That. Are you going to change that? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Um, so Zoe's going to share a little bit about what she's doing today and talk a little bit about her life um, from commune to Instagram. <laughs> now it's my turn. You can click. Okay. So this is my version of a pavlova. Um, a pavlova is based on a meringue, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and it's crispy on the outside and sort of ethereal and beautiful and stuffed with beautiful um, things, usually like something a little bit sour, like a passion fruit. So I'm it's like an Australian, lemon. actually. Yes, <laughs> yeah. sour on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's why I chose, I thought it would be super sassy to make one for him. But also, this is my most popular Instagram post. Um, I did this for a corporate client for Netflix. They hired me to promote a show that they were doing, Sugar Rush. And I threw this up and it was pretty and I was pleased with it, but it went crazy. It just went bonkers. Um, I had 215,000 impressions. At the time, I only had 50,000 followers. So I've grown, this is, under a year ago, and I've grown almost 100,000, in part to this. Um, so tons of likes, website clicks. The client was crazy happy <laughs> with the results of this. Um, but how did I get there? How did that happen to me? Um, I started out as 
Keith said on a commune. I wasn't allowed to eat sugar, which is probably why I only eat sugar now. Um, um, no internet. In fact, I lived in a teepee. We didn't even have electricity. So internet was, you know, this is 1967. Um, and so I came from a very creative family. My mother is a dancer. My father started the first co-op in Vermont. Um, and then fast forward a, a few years, I was eight. We did finally get electricity. And this <laughs> happened to me. This changed my world. And it's nothing but a light bulb. And I'd mix up this batter, and I'd send it through that machine, and magic would happen. And I was, that was it. That sort of set my life course ahead. Um, so this, you could argue that this was the first time technology kicked you into gear. Yeah. Technology called technology. electricity. And yeah. sugar, right? <laughs> yes, Thank electricity, you, Betty right? Yeah. yeah. So fast forward from there, um, I end up in college. I got um, a degree in photography and English, which everybody said would be useless in the world, <laughs> and I'd have a hard time, you know, surviving on those two degrees. And one of the classes that I did take was a business class. It was a requirement, and I dreaded every second of it. But he had me write a business plan. And I wrote a business plan about cookies. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to stop school and start this company. This is a really great idea. So I went, I got a small loan, I started my company. I, made, I didn't make money, but I didn't lose money either. Um, and it's, you know, it sort of confirmed my love of baking. I did end up graduating, going back and graduating. Um, and then I, it did send me off to eventually to culinary school. But what I realized is that the creativity isn't just about beautiful things. I had to figure out how to, um, one, how to bake, because I would try things, you know, when I was experimenting with my cookies. I actually had my very first KitchenAid um, in college, and I threw a solid block of frozen butter into it and just destroyed the gears, like the first day. So I brought it back to the company. They rebuilt it with um, a professional engine. But I didn't know what I was doing. So everything was an experiment. Everything was a slight disaster. So it was like one step forward, 12 steps back. So I needed to figure out the science of what I was doing. So I eventually ended up at the CIA, which is the Culinary Institute of America, not the spy organization. <laughs> and I learned the science. I had to know how to create the recipe so that I could I, I'm terrible at following a recipe, but I had to understand a little bit of the science so that I could play, you know, so that I could be creative. If you don't understand that science, you really don't have anywhere to go. Um, what they were teaching me in culinary school is how to cook for other people. The internet wasn't a thing yet. I was creating food to feed other people, and then my life changed entirely because I had kids and I left the restaurant world because it was nuts. You couldn't have a family and work every, I was working 80 hours a week. I loved it, but you can't do that with kids. So I had this wealth of knowledge. I had this creative career. I was creating four people to eat and then I had to step back from that. And I had to figure out how can I continue to do what I love to do and not be in the service world. And I ended up writing cookbooks because that was something I could do on my own. Um, I have a writing partner. We have eight books out in the world. Our first book came out. We were not superstars. We were not on the Food Network, but we needed to sell this book. And blogging was a brand new thing. We started our first blog in 2007, and we knew that if we got our book out to other bloggers, that 
they would help us sell it. And our publisher was like, bloggers, who are they? How, why would we give our, your book to them? You need to be on TV. And we knew that just wasn't going to happen. So we did get it out to bloggers, and it went viral. We have 800,000 books out in the world. Um, and part of that was starting our blog. This is my very first blog post on my Zoe Bakes blog. This is, I don't, you can't even tell what that picture is. The photography was terrible. The layout was terrible. I didn't know what I was doing. Instagram didn't even exist. Pinterest, you can see that little Pinterest button there. I had six people pin that photo. So we didn't know what we were doing, but we knew that this was the new world for us. Fast forward, this is my Instagram account now. Um, I have, like I said, I actually have 142,000 since we did this. So it's gone up a couple thousand in the last couple of days. Um, and this is where I live. I spend about 10 hours a day on Instagram. And it is where my business lives. This is where my peers are. This is where my clients are. This is where my audience is. And I have figured out how to run a business on this platform. And what goes into each one of those posts? So this is my, this is a, a you know, a pretty good setup of what I have going on. I look at what I've got. I don't want to repeat. I don't want to have too many cookies in a row. I don't want to have too many pies in a row. I don't want to have too many things in a circle. So I'm sort of looking at it from uh, an aesthetic look. I'm also looking at it from a chocolate to a flavor thing. So I'm researching what's trending, what's the season, what ingredients are hot, what are other people doing. I also have a strategy in terms of, like I explained, what I'm going to do next. If I'm working for a client, what are they doing? And then also my craft, what am I interested in? I'll go to the store and I'll get inspired by something. So it's a bunch of different things go into what I'm actually going to post. Whoop, back. One of the things, like I said, is that um, I have to understand the recipes. But now I don't just have to understand the recipes because I'm making them for other people. I have to understand the recipe because I have to communicate that to other people. One of the things that I do is I'll put up a recipe and I'll put up a tutorial, which I'll talk about in a second. And I'll get about 25 to 35,000 people watching those videos. And about 25 to 50 of those people will have made it by the end of that day. And then by the next weekend, 100 people will have. And then by the following weekend, a couple hundred. So if my recipes don't work, I will hear about it immediately, like absolutely in the second. It's the most incredible experience of my life because I put something out there, I get the feedback immediately. And I can, luckily because of the platform, I can adjust if I have made a mistake, but I have to test the living daylights out of my recipes to make sure that anybody, any skill level can repeat it. I did this with a cookie recipe. It took me about a week to master that cookie recipe so that I could make sure that not only could people make the cookie recipe, but they could alter the recipe to suit their own taste. Because my favorite cookie recipe is going to be different than yours and yours. And I wanted people to be able to have the fun of understanding a little bit of the science in order to change the recipe to their needs. This is what changed my whole life, is discovering the stories or the videos that you could do on Instagram. Because I'm a visual learner, and I wanted to be able to create tutorials. Because people were asking me questions, and trying to explain it was difficult. But showing was exactly what changed everything, so that people could watch my video and repeat it. Even if I'm doing, I mean, this is an example of a chocolate cake I made in a mug in a microwave. 
not the hardest thing, but I've done croquembouche, which is a tower of, of puffs, of uh, cream puffs, and I've done really intricate cakes. And people will make those as well as something as simple as this. The music that I choose turns out to be equally as important because tons of people are watching my videos, not because they're ever gonna bake, but because it relaxes them. <laughs> I have a lot of people that say they watch my videos before they go to bed at night because their stressful day is taken away. I mean, whatever your reason is, fine with me. I'd love for you to bake. Uh, tons of people do, and so they repost me, and it turns into this lovely cycle of they, I repost them, and it's just this lovely community. I also um, do things on YouTube, but that takes a lot more effort. This is my tool. This is where I do everything on Instagram. I don't need anybody else. I don't need a crew. I don't need lighting. I have my window. I have my, can uh, my phone, and I create these videos. YouTube's a much bigger process. I do need to get onto YouTube because Instagram hasn't monetized these videos yet, and I am a business, so I need to figure out how to generate that income, which you can do on YouTube. So I also take all of my own photographs, um, and these are the sort of still photos that you'll see on my posts. So I did use my degree, thank you. <laughs> and the New York Times- you used it twice. I used it twice. <laughs> the New York Times didn't, um, didn't mention me for my baking or my photography, but for the captions that I write on my Instagram posts. So the captions are really important because they're what sort of suck people in and make them feel like they can do this. And it sort of creates the story behind what I'm baking. But who knew that's what I would get the intention for? So yes, my English degree and my photography. Thank you, parents, for that. Um, I do um, process my photos, but very, very minimally. Again, because people are going to recreate this, I cannot be doing any false advertising. I can't make this look better than it is, because if they can't recreate that, then I've, you know, they're going to get frustrated and go. So I only minimally touch it up. I might brighten it or you know something like that, but very, very little. Um, so, you know, I go through all of these steps on my website of putting up the pictures, of writing the the post. Um, mostly, what I'm doing is creating links and optimizing for SEO, because again, this is a business. I link to, if it's a sponsored post, I link to my affiliate programs. I have all kinds of links within. I link to Instagram. Everything is leading back to my website because that's where I can make money. <laughs> so I have to use, um, I have to use my website. I have to use Instagram all to come back to that. Pinterest, that first picture I did had six pins. The uh, Pavlova has 10,000, so things have changed a little bit over the years. Same thing with Instagram. I, you know, I add the photos, I write the captions. One of the most important things are hashtags because hashtags bring people in where they may not have ever known about me before that Pavlova, I had 70% of the people that saw that photo had never heard of me before. They had never seen me before. They found me through hashtags and other people reposting it. Had nothing to do with people being in love with me. It had everything <coughs> to do with Instagram's algorithm, with them and their hashtags. So, adding that kind of stuff, tagging people who might repost me. And this is all stuff that they do not teach you at the CIA. They teach you how to cook. They do not teach you how to run a business. So this is all stuff that I had to go and figure out and create. The other thing that I do 
is I'm in conversation with these people. I answer every comment, I answer every question. It's really about my community. If I don't know what they're thinking and I'm not in communication with them, they'll go. So who knew that my love of baking and that little light bulb would turn into a business? Thank you, Betty Crocker. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I think what I, what I love about this story is that if you peel it back, you peel back the layers, I mean, it's kind of a case study to me of, of contemporary business, of how this kind of, this, this ecosystem you, you, you exist in is reliant upon your ability to constantly morph, to constantly listen, change and adjust, yeah. which is really what all businesses need to be able to do now. It's easy when you're one person. But there's much more challenging when you're, when you're 60 or when you're, I don't know, how many thousands at, uh, at, at, Land, at Land of Lakes. So speaking of Land of Lakes, Tim, we're going to hear from you now yeah. with regard to... Uh, Can I get the clicker, Zoe? Oh, yes. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, um, awesome to be here. Thank you all for getting up early and enjoying the food. And I'm excited to try the pebble. I've never had one before. So <laughs> oh, yeah. It's be a lot of fun. Great. Um, so, you know, in my experience, when we talk about creativity and we talk about business and kind of the relationship, I think that the, the, the problem word is the word creativity. You know, as Matt said earlier, creativity makes me nervous. Isn't that interesting that this thing that as a child we're encouraged, go draw and, and make things with Play-Doh, but then when you become an adult, you, you say things like creativity makes me nervous. You know, and we see this especially in the more sort of logical sides of business, which might be law or finance, you know, oh, creativity, I, I don't know, that's not, that's not for me. And, and, and I agree with Heath, I think that's kind of part of the problem. Um, so when I, when, I, when I think about my experience and my role and the, and the work that we're doing at Land Lakes, we're trying to diffuse that. We're trying to say, no, everybody has to have some component of creativity, and it may have to do with a kind of a misunderstood definition of well, what do you mean by creativity. Um, but this, this notion that, you know, to, to sort of preface um, conversations, say, well, that's not my role, or, or to apologize for, for something which is innately human, uh, your ability to draw, everyone has the ability to draw, everyone has the ability to take a picture, you know, to, to perform, maybe not at the most amazing level, but you still have the ability. So we shouldn't be apologizing uh, as a preface. Just, it is what it is, right? And so I, I think part of the, um, the, the challenge is recognizing that we've, you know, we, we look at our backgrounds in business and we have like ISO 9001 and we have all these very logical uh, um, mechanisms and methodologies for improving business. You know, we get, we get sharper with the numbers. Um, but I think we've started to realize that there's a point where you can't get any more sharp with the numbers. There's a point where logistics doesn't get any more efficient. And at that point, you're, it's a zero sum game for everybody. So the more creative enterprise might be the one that can surprise everybody else and, and come out ahead. So um, I'm a little bit, uh, I think that the challenge is to look at the word creativity a little bit differently. So, um, and, there's, and there's growing evidence of all this. Here, we'll, uh, a couple of books. If you like reading, I recommend all, all of these different books for various reasons. Um, you know, for, for example, if you want to look at creativity uh, from an operational standpoint, so from an operational cultural standpoint, Ed Catmull's book on Creativity Inc. is, is a great one, or even Pressfield's The War of Art uh, is another great book to look at how uh, operations and cultural uh, dynamics can be infused with creativity to make them more uh, productive, or we can look at pragmatic processes. Even if you look at Drucker's book from the 60s, The Effective Executive, or uh, Jim Collins' flywheel monograph. Um, these are books which, at the root, are, are kind of talking about how we enable a greater range of thinking and how we enable and encourage creativity across the organization. Or if you're looking at, at affecting behavior, right? we would like our, our team, we would like our customers to behave in a different way. Uh, Tim Wu's book or uh, Rory Sutherland's book on alchemy uh, or, or our Moon's book on different, th though all of those, again, speak to the power of creativity as a mechanism for uh, affecting the way that business can behave. So uh, there's, there's plenty of evidence out there, I think, uh, uh, in terms of how all of that can function. So, but I, I wanna share sort of three, um, 
three sort of ingredients, if you will. We've got ingredients for pavlova. I want to share some sort of three ingredients that I've found kind of help uh, in, infuse creativity within business. So uh, the first one is drumming. Uh, we should give the drummer some. Uh, this is a guy named Chester Thompson. Uh, he plays with uh, Genesis, the Bee Gees, Frank Zappa. Amazing drummer, but he's also a really great thinker. And he had this quote, which was uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, which has stuck with me for a long time. And, and I think it speaks to sort of the first ingredient that uh, will help us bring more creativity into our business. And the quote is, learn as much as you can, then forget it all and play what you feel. So if you think of it, there's sort of three, three parts to that. There's learn, then there's this forget it part, which we'll kind of gloss over. But then play what you feel is, is equally important. Um, and, and really, that learn as much as you can is, speaks to what Zoe was talking about. She had to learn the science. So uh, learning, uh, when you talk about learn as much as you can, I actually think we're talking about process. So we're talking about rigor. We're talking about science. And, and I think it might surprise some people to think, oh, creativity is all uh, paints and, and, and fabric and light and color. It is, but it's also about learning history. It's about pedagogy. Um, as, as a music major, I spent 95% of my time not making things up, but sitting in the practice room going through rudiments, sitting in the practice room playing scales, sitting in the practice room looking at music theory and music harmony. So I, I often think one of the things that can make more logical or more process-oriented people uh, comfortable in the realm of creativity is to look at, um, look at the process of it, to look at the science behind the creativity, and to say, um, when we look at Picasso and we think, oh, look at his sense of color, Picasso had a really keen, highly researched, uh, knowledgeable understanding of what pigments, how pigments worked, and how color theory worked. So it wasn't just, oh, I'll just use that blue. He understood how that blue scientifically played off of that red. So there, there's a great degree of science and rigor that's available to us when we think about creativity. And so process might be the, 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 the avenue or the door through which you bring greater creativity into your organization. It's incredible, Tim, when you, um, when you sniff around to right. discover how many programmers also happen to, amazing, amazing technologists right. also happen to be musicians. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, there's no, it's not a coincidence that these, that these skill sets live kind of hand in hand. Yeah, and, and, and I think they have to, right? And music especially, you look at Bach, Bach is incredibly mathematical, mm -hmm. right? So the second area, uh, that, the second ingredient, right, of this idea of creativity, and probably the most obvious, is this notion of art, right? And um, as Zoe said, you know, but creativity isn't just about beautiful things. And, and I think that one of the, the challenges that we face in business is that we go, oh, those are the creative people, the arty people. Um, and and I, would, I would suggest that where we need the art is in logistics. Where we need the art is in distribution and pricing and merchandising. And to say, to say yes, there is an efficiency play, there is a, a you know, there's a logical play to how we're gonna get the product from point A to point B, but it's like that, that the story of, um, you know, the tractor trailer that got stuck in the, uh, in the tunnel. And they got all the smart people, all the adults, all the logical people to go, well, now we have to rebuild the tunnel and whatever. And, and it's the kid that walks up and says, just take the air out of the tires. And they went, <laughs> oh, we take the air out of the tires. It's low enough. Now we can pull the truck out of the tunnel. It's, again, looking at things in a different way. And so that's kind of the gift, if you will, of creativity is that it enables us, it encourages us, it allows us to say, Yes, this, this situation, this challenge or opportunity, we're confronting it. How else might we look at it? What, how might we juxtapose our thinking? You know? and, I, and I think, again, it's, it's built upon a rigor of a vast body of knowledge that you've learned in school, et cetera, et cetera. So art is the second ingredient. And then the third is, is risk. Um, and I think one of the things that I think this is probably the, the real reason why most people will say, oh, no, I'm not creative, or, or say they're the creative ones, or I, I couldn't possibly, it, is that it speaks to risk. And we're all afraid. You know, it's the notion of creativity is kind of a recognition that we're going to walk into the fog. We're going to row out into the fog. We don't know what's out there. We don't know if the answer is out there. We don't know if there are monsters out there. Um, and, and it's a real human uh, uh, connection thing to, to think I'm going to put myself out there. If you think, if your challenge today is we need you to write a hit song, 
or we need you to stand on stage and, and, and perform right now. Um, it gets to like a, 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 a real fragility in, in our human psyche. And so I think welcoming risk and saying, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna welcome risk to the table, we're gonna give it a seat at the table, we're gonna talk about it, is hugely important towards uh, enabling greater creativity at work. One of the things that we're doing at Land O'Lakes uh, that I'm, uh, I'm really attracted to is our leadership team will publicly speak to, to risk and to risk taking. Um, our CEO stood up in front of a couple thousand people and said, I need you, all of you in the room, to take more risks. I need you to be more entrepreneurial. And, to, and I think that's critical to have the highest levels of the organization speak to all levels of the organization about taking risks and failing is okay. You know, um, going out and, and trying uh, multiple ways, and maybe you fail a few, and, but you learn something, that that's really, really important. And I think that's inherent to the creative process. I think this, is, uh, that, that gets back to this challenge right. that we've, has been sort of thrust upon us as kids, as we've been shaped from very early years, is that failure wasn't necessarily an option. Right. That getting into that school, that getting that ACT score, that da, 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 like yeah. it goes on and on. And that works, that just sort of completely flies in the face of what we need in order yeah. to think as people, the opportunity to get it wrong, and that gives us the chance to find out when it's right. Right. You know, it's like little Susie as a child, it's okay if she uh, tries something and fails, but little Susie with her MBA uh, in her, you know, SVP level job, uh, failure is not an option. Why? You know, I, I, is just because the mortgage is at risk or something like that? So I, I often feel like we have to kind of balance those things and, and publicly welcoming and discussing as a group to say, um, that risk is is okay. That it's the, it's part of it's going to be part of the process. Is something that you learn when you're in an art school or when you because you're doing crits all the time. You know, it's like put your work up on the wall and everyone's going to talk about it. Or as a musician, uh, you know, we're going to perform in front of each other and now we're going to talk about it. Hey Tim, I didn't really like the way you weren't carrying the time very well and your solo at the break on that last tune was was awful. You know, so you, you gain an armor in art school. I think that you, you gain a, a, an ability to hear criticism and accept it and learn from it. And I, and I, and I sometimes wonder if that's something that would be of, of greater value in some of the MBA programs, because I, I, I don't sense, at least on the sort of more business side of things, maybe they do in law school. I don't, do they teach you how to, to kind of welcome risk into the room? And, and although they don't. <laughs> so well, Tony, that gets to David Kenny's comment of building a risk tolerant culture. right? right? I think that's really key, and doing it from the top, as yeah. your CEO has yeah. been. So been. process, art, and risk are, are, are sort of the three ways that I think organizations can kind of open doors and, and bring greater creativity into, into the fold. But I want to hear how, how a lawyer opens a, a fabulous restaurant. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Pass the buck. So Annie, um, I kind of, I, I, I'm so happy you're sharing your story with us today because I have this big belief, this sort of firm belief that successful businesses are built on a triple bottom line methodology. It's a, it's a concept, if I'm not mistaken, was kind of created in the mining industry where they really had to, of course, everyone's beating up the mining industry, but they had to be really conscious of their environmental impact, their social impact, and of course, the financial bottom line. So those three parts are very much a key, a key elements, key pillars in the way you've structured the Lynn Hall here. Um, we're sort of, most of us would be aware, and certainly maybe all of us would be aware that the restaurant game is a tough one. And you kind of, as the winds of change blow and palates change and tastes change and opinions shift, you could be left holding the baby <laughs> and having a significant um, investment, mm -hmm. uh, personal investment, standing there kind of twiddling your thumbs wondering, why did we do this? So share with us, if you will, that this, this concept of taking that first leap of thinking strategically about how you wanted to sort of set up the Lynn Hall story. Well, and we were talking a little bit about this last night, right? I mean, this was definitely a journey for me. I didn't just, I, it's funny when I talk to people and they say, oh, did you just wake up someday and decide that you wanted to open a restaurant? I'm like, no, <laughs> do I look that cavalier? No, absolutely not. You know, this was much like Zoe's journey, and I know we talked a little bit about this yesterday, 
I think back to that Steve Jobs commencement speech, if anybody's heard it, where he reflects back on his life and he sees why it was that he took that calligraphy class in college. And that then, in the future, was the thing that influenced the fonts that we now have available to us. And much like your, your journey from you know, Vermont to here and what you're doing on Instagram, I feel like my life has very much followed that. That, you know, being a lawyer for seven years was absolutely instrumental. I use my lawyer training every day, whether it's, you know, evaluating a risk, dealing with a potential work comp claim, dealing with employment law. I, the training that you get, much like an artist, is something that's valuable throughout life, right? Um, but taking those years then and living in London and spending time there and being influenced by travel and food and culture, you know, that was something that I really, because I'm not a good cook, and that's the irony of opening a restaurant, is that I, <laughs> I joke that I did it to feed my children. Um, and it, but, but really that yearning to be around creatives when, you know, and I think that's why I'm drawn to like loving music and having you know this dream of someday standing on a stage and playing a guitar. And every time I try to play the guitar, I'm horrible. But I think just being around creatives and the energy that I get is um, is was really on my journey. I kept getting drawn toward wow, wouldn't it be interesting to like have this great food community where we have this beautiful studio where people can come and create content and have really interesting experiences around food and conversation and having that tie together with an incubator startup kitchen where we can help food startups that come in and you know have have their grandmother's salsa and want to have a place where they can work side by side with seasoned chefs and ask those questions and have a space for non-food creatives to display their artwork in our in, in our um, Ambleside room. You know, all of these things were sort of influenced by my love of being in public markets and visiting, you know, all these different markets and cities and connecting and having relationships and community and and I'm just such an experience junkie and that's absolutely what the Lynn Hall is. It's, it's a lot. Of, it's yeah. a really fun sandbox we it's, always say to play in. It's interesting to me that you you shared with us that you um, really enjoyed being around creatives yet everything else you've shared with us is from my perspective at least indicative of a creative way of thinking and operating having a vision for something having the sort of the, the courage to sort of strategize around how to bring that vision to life and even that last stuff of putting yourself into different places and experiences and learning I mean, at Padilla, we have a, a, a belief of wonder and wonder. Like, get up out of your seat and go and discover things and go and learn new things and be influenced by stuff. And that, to me, is a really classic example of that. Um, but when you kick this thing, when you sort of give birth to this thing, I guess one of the challenges is um, setbacks, right? One of the challenges is, challenges are. There are so many in this industry that you've, sh certainly the ones that you've shared with me, um, would put most people back onto their heels but I think another really great demonstration of creativity is that resilience and that need, as certainly as you shared, to sort of got that wrong, got that recipe wrong, that cake flopped, I've got to come back, learn more, what strategize, next? what next? Now, yeah. Like what next? So share with us maybe, if you will, some of the Well, some and of some of you may know, I mean, we kind of laugh about this, that you, know, you come in and literally pull the curtain back and you're like, whoa, there's some stuff going on back there. That <laughs> don't know if I wanted to know about. But I think the tough thing about opening a business, and I always say the easy part was the idea. You know, we moved back from London at the end of 2008, and I started dreaming about this concept, and we opened in um, June of 2017. So, I mean, there was a lot of fits and starts, and there was a lot of going back to the drawing board and waiting for the right people to present themselves. But then opening, and I've shared this with you, you were with us on this journey, Padilla was, and you know, I, I got a little cocky and I thought, well, this is easy. Like, I got, <laughs> I got this dream team of chefs and bakers and general manager, and then five weeks in, um, I will never forget, I was sitting in the space and our head chef at that time came in and he said, I'm leaving. I'll be gone in four weeks, I'm going back to work for my mentor, Tim, Tim McKee. And I literally was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I, I, we, I mean, as you're ramping up in a huge operation and, you know, add into that the, the press and, the, you know, the media and the feedback that people are getting then to all of a sudden have to rethink, you know, I feel like out of the gates, it was one thing to have a creative idea, but now it's 
how do we get creative in responding to staffing challenges to an industry that is disproportionately struggling with mental health and chemical health issues? How do we continue to show up as employers to support people that are struggling? You know, we don't have the luxury of, in the legal world, it was, you know, you have to have a legal degree and you have, you know, you can kind of have the resume, right? Um, here, it's, there's, Anybody, we welcome the masses. We welcome anyone um, to be a part of this team. And there's a lot of training. You know, now that the the local culinary schools have closed, you know, we're doing a lot of on-the-job training. Mm -hmm. And there's that creative piece again. And, and I loved what you said, Tim, earlier about just like really redefining what creativity mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. I think about and and laugh about. We were joking about this yesterday that I will never forget in seventh grade when I presented you know, a drawing to my art teacher and she's like, oh, you better think about a different career than art. <laughs> um, you know, I think to me it was always art and drawing and create that's connected to creativity and I thought that is not me. But now I look at the world and I look at how you see the world and now how our children see the world and you, it is this constantly you know, uh, just fast paced and, sort of and churn almost, yes, yeah. and really not just responding to, but looking ahead to the horizon of what's coming next, and and then figuring out a strategy around that. I think that pace is really um, is a perfect example of. I mean, for you, I mean, Zoe, it is minute by minute. I mean, it's astounding to me that one post, your Pavlova post. I mean, that's a week's work. Yeah, um, sometimes. A lot of people might think, oh yeah, Instagram, Snap, made something, photographed to put it on, like most of us, maybe as regular everyday Joes would be doing it, but these are very considered, planned activities. Um, even when things like the pilot leaving the cockpit <laughs> five weeks after you know, you've taken off, um, now what do we do? The plane's up, we're at 30,000 feet, okay, we have to rethink about this. Time for the co-pilot to step up, time to rethink how this team works together, who can we draw upon from the crew to fill the gaps. Those are really, that's a really creative process of understanding how team works. Well, it, you know, we said process, art, risk. Resilience is clearly like, it's, it's a creative act in the sense of, you know, if you're, if you're painting and you go, oh, I didn't, my brain didn't mean for the brush to go where it is. But it went where it did, and, the, and the, the, the ink is on the canvas. Or you're playing music, and you played a note that you didn't intend to play. You know, as so many other musicians have said, from Chick Corea to Herbie Hancock, it is about what you do next. If, if you repeat it, you, 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 you build upon it, you, you were resilient in a way. People go, oh, that sounded like a great solo. They have no idea that you think you made a mistake. You know, so I, I do feel like, you know, one of the things, your, your chef leaves, it's not... It's not that the chef leaves, it's what do you do with the opportunity now that you've discovered, oh, well, this isn't the team we're gonna have in four weeks, so now what? And I think that an ability to welcome now what uh, is, is very much a creative ability. It's a muscle that you kind of, you develop over time. And um, to, I, it goes to that expectation that I think many people look at business, and maybe this goes back to kind of like the industrial age, but that, that business will somehow be reliable and predictable and, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the same thing will happen and we can kind of, there's a comfort. We want that, right, this sort of reliability. But creativity says, hey, maybe not, folks. There may be a storm. Your chef may quit. And so you need to welcome this skill set into the organization because we don't know. It, things are moving so quickly today, moving so fast, that having a resilience, a creative resilience in your organization is is almost table stakes. Mm. When I did crew, I rode crew, and I always wondered, sitting on that river in 120 degrees, what the hell I was actually learning there. But one of my gr favorite coaches always said, you may think you're only as good as the last stroke, so you sure as hell <laughs> make sure the next one's better. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that, and that to me is a great parallel for life. Right. And I think, you know, in, in looking at how teams change and how you reinvent and rebuild teams as you're working right. through this, and he, the, I mean, help us understand that process. I mean, the radar has to be on full the whole time. Well, and I feel like I should probably back up a step that too, that for me, so much of Lynn Hall has the DNA of those years that I spent working with children's mental health mm -hmm. and abused children in the system once I came back to the U.S. And, you know, I had so many amazing mentors and we were talking this morning about Brene Brown and, and some of her writings about shame and leadership. And she has this wonderful new book out, Dare to Lead. And, 
you know, I feel like I lean so much on those mentors even now, not just in the Nourish series and the Wisdom series and the different work that we're doing now, but, you know, really it all is fundamentally comes back to relationships and being in a community with others. In the Lynn Hall, and our vision and our mission statement is really about that. We are a culinary community, and it's that is, I always say to our team, the Lynn Hall is always going to be bigger than any one person. And they keep pushing me up, and I keep pushing back down, and I keep saying, no, we are a team. We are a creative team. Whether you are a baker, whether you're a barista, we are a team. And But we're all coming together around that mission and that vision for what it is that we want to be and what we want to provide every day, which is you know, that radical hospitality in multiple ways, not just the food that you eat, but the experiences that you have, whether you're coming in and you're working in the studio. So that's where I feel like we continue to push the boundaries on being creative in the way that we show up for the public, how we show up internally for our team, how we show up in collaboration with the community. You know, all of this work that we're doing in May in recognition of Mental Health Month, it's, it's all community, you know, my mentors, it's all community healers and natural mental health people that are coming in and continuing. We're all about collaboration. And I think that in turn helps continue to feed those creative juices. I am much more eager to go out not and, and encourage our team to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And we have developed, you know, I wouldn't have met Zoe if it wasn't the feed feed that brought her in. Of course mm -hmm. I had some of her cookbooks. Had I baked out of them? No, because <laughs> as my as Because you were husband, scared of being in the I kitchen. was scared. Yeah, 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 yeah. As my husband <laughs> says, for somebody who doesn't cook, you haven't just a lot of cookbooks. So when I open Lynn Hall, so <laughs> when I open Lynn Hall, I now have a place to put the cookbooks and get them out of our kitchen. I noticed it's up there. Thank <laughs> he's, you. He's very patient. So I think building and rebuilding a team, you know, I, and I absolutely love what you said, Tim, about being responsive to, you know, embracing that. I was just saying this to my 14 year old goalie boy this weekend. He was so disappointed in how he played and just we have to break through this attitude of you're always going to get it right you're always going to be happy because we are doing a tremendous disservice to our children to each other and i think one of the most empowering things for me on this journey um you know now almost two years in is all sit in meetings and uh with other entrepreneurs and when i'm vulnerable and i break through the like wow i really am not getting this and really missed the boat on that and then they'll be vulnerable. And then all of a sudden I realize like, yeah, you don't know what you're doing either. Okay? <laughs> like we're all just showing up every day. And we're all just human and we're just trying to figure it out whether you have a law degree, an MBA, and this or that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like that's really, it comes back to this training that I have. And I, I lean on all the time about those powers of being in relationship and being in community with others. Um, so that then, you know, really, it empowers our team to think mm -hmm. about that too, that it's not about stopping yourself and and we talked about this as well about you know i go back to this sort of wizard and lizard brain mm. and how do you in those times of struggle um push through the reaction that you your physio physiology physiology your brain physiology says like shut off this just run for the hills mm -hmm. and i'm constantly saying to our team it's okay we need to move on let's reflect on it let's learn let's move forward because if you live back here, you're doing such a disservice to the process and to the team and to continuing to move forward as a company. But again, it's all those things that at the time I didn't realize why I was being mentored and learning these things about mental health, but every day we, we absolutely lean on that and continue yeah. to educate ourselves about it. Um, I'd like to make a suggestion to anyone in the room or maybe who's listening online, watching online, if you are responsible for developing curriculum uh, in an MBA, let's get time spent in a restaurant because I certainly yeah. my years in a restaurant, my oh, years yeah. working with people, exactly. it is a microcosm of, of learning how to work and struggle and manage a, a business. You learn a lot um, and certainly what you're sharing with us is, is, is alluding to that. Um, I guess the other part of that is this concept of, of creativity through service, like working, working with people, working for people. Um, Certainly, we are big believers that put in the concept of, of servant leadership and that we work with, to, with people, we s serve one another. How can I be the best version of me for you so you can, in turn, you know, return the favor? Um, it's a really important part of the Lynn Hall, from my understanding. 
Yeah, people get confused because we have this big social justice piece, right? And I feel like, and, and I say this to our team all the time last year, uh, we had, during the month of May, we had um, some of my mentors come in and do a whole talk about trauma and how trauma behaviors show up in the workplace. And like I said, I mean, we there's a reason now that I understand this collision of these two worlds have come together with having this background dealing with mental health and now ending up in an industry that next to mining and construction has the largest and, and by far is continuing to escalate in the level of addiction issues and, and overdose. It's like the house is on fire, right? We, we can't ignore it anymore. And um, my dear friend Scott and mentor used to say to me, Annie, I'm tired of admiring the problem. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when I have a duty that once I know and we know, then we need to do better. And so, so much of our collaboration and our ongoing social justice piece of what we do here and the, and the, the events around that and the fundraising that we're doing for our long table fund in, in directly going back and helping those in our industry that are struggling is really because we, we know now and we need to do better in response to that. And we also know, you know, we're, we're in talks with Hazelden and some of these large organizations that I am hearing these constant themes of, I saw it in the child welfare system, I saw it in the criminal justice system. We all have become so siloed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and this is no disrespect to, to your work, Zoe, but, you know, the phone, the computers, mm -hmm. it doesn't help, right? How do we get back to that yearning that people have for being in relationship with one another? And I feel like a lot of that goes back to how do we as a community band together and join forces, that it's not just about Hazelden staying in the Hazelden recovery bucket. Right. It's about how do we work in a community with, you know, an organization like Lynn Hall and other restaurants that we are on the front lines. We're in the trenches every day. We have our employees that are actively helping us understand how to develop a recovery friendly trauma informed workplace. But I certainly am in no place to be writing curriculum and doing all of these things that can make us be better. So leaning on those outside individuals, leaning on those outside entities, and really developing more of these collaborations, that's to me what I hear people yeah, telling me yeah. that they want. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to creativity, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just you stay in your ivy tower, I'm gonna stay in my ivy tower, and we're all gonna come up and do a bunch of these different concepts and different projects, but at the end of the day, everybody's just gonna spin themselves into the ground, and are we really moving the work forward? Mm -hmm. And, and again, I, I just, I think that's the way of the future. Yeah, I yeah. think it's a way that we really are gonna move the dial on so many of the societal things that we're struggling with. And I think also really bring people back into community and address some of those mental health. And you know, I, I always call it, when I was prosecuting, it was meth. That was the big epidemic. You know, before that it was cocaine and heroin and you know, now it's opioids. And people wanna talk about the opioid epidemic. I wanna talk about that it's the diseases of despair. We are now in living in such isolation. And I see that with my children. It's like, put the phone down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a different way that they communicate and I need to respect that. But I also, we know now from a brain science perspective that it is not the same dopamine levels that respond when you are looking at somebody in the eye across the table from one another that's when the true magic happens. And we need that as yeah, humans. Yeah. It's what you, you talk a lot about uh, moments where we've got to let go, and I think we've got to let go. I was talking with, um, with a CEO the other day who said, who the hell invented the term work-life balance? <laughs> if there is only life, <laughs> right? And life is work, and it's just what we do, and we've just got to navigate our way through it, and hopefully we get mentorship Hopefully, we get advice and we can work together to make to work it out. Well, I would say, like, so one of the themes that you're talking about is this is the myth of perfection, yeah. right? And so you go to <laughs> business, you know, you, you, business would like to present the facade of perfection. There's nothing, no trauma behind the scenes. That everything's working great, but it, it, but creativity says that can't possibly be true, right? You're gonna fail dozens of times before you make something that looks perfect, right? And, and you know, the camera lies about what we don't, you know, what we don't see. And so celebr or celebrating like, like non-perfection, I think is, is really a really important way. And that's another avenue of sort of bringing creativity into, into business is to say, hey, we're not expecting perfection here, which is a really odd concept. But I, I, I sort of believe that Part of the reason we have so much despair is that we worship this notion of perfection that's unrealistic, 
uh, is poisonous that doesn't that doesn't really help us get the work done. Yeah. Well, and I, I think agree. again, to not deal with it directly right. affects creativity. Yeah. It directly affects the ability for our chefs, for our baker, for our, you know, to be creative if if they are constantly living in this place. Right. Fear is a bad fear is a bad place to live for anyone trying to kind Absolutely. of to, to work loosely, come up with concepts, to think through something, and look for opportunity to do stuff different, which is really right. where we're going today. So we've spoken about a lot. We've spoken about a lot here. So maybe here's a handful of like key takeaways we can kind of scribble down because um, there's a lot to take in. Um, and we have a pavlova to eat. How, so. how do I, we have a pavlova to eat. How, <laughs> how do I draw the parallels with an, an Instagram baker with, when it comes to my business? Um, massive $40 billion organization. How do, how do I associate with that if I'm a small business? How do I understand the, the cosmos that is um, a restaurant and all the permutations and combinations that form that business? Well, when it comes to creativity, there are themes. And, and we heard talking about how we plan for it. But you have to make time to work out how we do this. This are strategies. We plan to write a piece of music. We plan to sit down and produce something. It takes time. And for any business that's under the pressure that has to produce something because someone's already responding to your recipe before you've even launched, put the image online, you have to be ready, right? So you've got to do our homework and that takes time, which takes money and there are very different conversations to have there. Um, don't hire in your own image. The Lynn Hall's a great example of, of a really amazing diverse set of people, individuals from different backgrounds, from in front of house, from back of house. We really do produce the best possible outcome when we have diverse thinking, when we have diverse perspectives and histories. Even if we think we look alike, dig deeper, scratch through that resume and understand where that person's come from, what the experiences are that they bring to the conversation. Um, to do that, you've got to fish from fresh ponds. Don't go to the MBA school that you've always been going to. Don't go to the same university you've been looking for. There are people out there who can help you, help you change your business. They can help change the way you're thinking about what you're doing. And they are well and truly uh, not going to be looking like everyone else you may have brought to the table in the past. That's a really tough one. Um, Hail the polymath. If you don't know what a polymath is, Leonardo da Vinci's birthday was last week. He was a polymath. Um, it basically is someone who has multiple, multiple skills and appears to be very, very good at most of them. Um, my friend on my left here, your right, is a great example of that. You can't run a business like that unless you have an extraordinarily broad skill set and capabilities, the ability to strategize and to deliver the craft. I mean, this is a great focus group of one. Um, every single one of you in this room has, is this person. We've just got to be given permission to get the opportunity to, un, to pull the corkscrew out instead of the knife in, my Swiss, in, this, in the Swiss Army knife that lives up here. Building a risk tolerant client it's okay to get something wrong. It really is. Um, I was really lucky that, to have a mentor who's a child development psychologist. My mother passed away very young, so she sort of stepped into the role of the advisor when it came to our children. And we listened to Margot every single day. <laughs> we said, what do we do now? She says, just give them the ability to get stuff wrong. Give them the space to explore and discover and help them build their confidence because their confidence is going to be one of the most important weapons in their entire life no matter what they're doing. That's a risk tolerant culture. Yeah. Give people the confidence to try something. Structure an award system to, so, to, to support that and encourage so Interestingly it. enough, uh, one of the things that just, we just launched a, uh, a program inside Orlando Lakes, they call it the Trailblazer Award. And it's specifically written to celebrate entrepreneurial behaviors to celebrate uh, individuals or teams that set out on a path, uh, but maybe failed, yeah. but, yeah. but succeeded in learning something critical for the organization. And uh, they were very careful about how they constructed this in terms of the way that people would apply for the award and, and how it's gonna be celebrated. But to the point of, we wanna put people's names on the wall, like permanently carved into the wall to say, this person, took the risks for the rest of us that led to a foundation that the rest of us can benefit from. So in institution, finding ways to institutionalize risk acceptance yeah. um, and, and, and sort of failure acceptance is, is really important. It's funny because there's a lot of organizations who are really anxious about heroing 
people right. or celebrating an individual because right. the team's very important. I think both is really important. Yeah. You yeah. need to set a precedent. We need to set a precedent. It's a big deal in your past life. Um, we need to set precedents up so people know what to look for. How do I model that behavior? How do I learn from that? Um, rethinking teams. A lot of us think throwing bodies at problems is the way to solve it. If you have fished from a fresh pond, if you've got new ways of thinking and people who can consider how a problem might be solved, wrap that team around it. We call it an ensemble team. Put the right people around the problem to solve that job and then draw upon the expertise that you have around you to make sure you get that done because the businesses are bigger than all of us and, we, and, we, and teamwork is the way we get that stuff done. Value and reward, curiosity, which is what you were alluding to, Tim. Celebrate it. Um, ce and celebrate the losses as well because sometimes a lot of effort went into that failure and no one likes to be, de it's bad enough that it didn't work. No one likes to be devalued uh, because it didn't and value is one of the top reasons that most of us lose, uh, lose, lose employees. Take the heat off. I spoke about the time it takes to do this stuff. Plan for time. Plan for the opportunity to give yourself time to think and to be strategic about what you're doing. Go for a walk. Change your scenery. When you go on your next holiday, when you go on your next event, go and do something different. Try a different restaurant. Eat something you may not have um, before. Um, I took a job, an opportunity presented itself. I hadn't had a holiday for a couple of years and a friend of mine said, do you want to help me on a project in the Middle East? The Middle East wasn't um, a place that most people were heading um, in 2003. <laughs> but I'm like, what the hell? What have I got to lose apart from the, being the father of a couple of kids? Um, my wife wasn't, wasn't particularly excited at the concept. But I learned so much from that experience that I was directly able to apply over the following years and continue to just by changing, just changing the landscape, learning about new people, learning about new cultures. Um, that might be a book. It might be as simple as a film. This is vital to the creative process. You can't draw on fresh resources if you haven't got the resources. Um, so that's all we have to share with you today, apart from answers, hopefully, to the questions you might have, and um, a lovely Australian pebble <laughs> <laughs> by way of New Zealand. Um, I think we're going to move to questions. Jeff has a roving microphone. We've got a couple of questions that may have come in already. Yes, before we um, take questions from the audience, we do have some questions from our YouTube Live audience. Oh, fantastic. Um, and this first one is for you, Tim. Um, he just talked about um, fishing in new ponds. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that Land Lakes does to attract and, ret and retain creative talent? Really quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think the, f the first thing that we do is we're public about that that's what we're doing. To say, we are looking for, we use words like entrepreneur, we use words like creative to describe the personalities that we're looking for. I think that a lot of care is put into the job description. You know, um, it's not cut and paste, boilerplate kind of HR language. So it's sort of, you step back and you look at all, the, all of the clues that might lead to and attract uh, a different type of personality to come into an organization because uh, you know I've only been there nine months. My boss has been there three years. Um, most of the people I work with have, are relatively new, and um, in kind of that's looking at that kind of group of, of individuals, um, a, a lot of, of specific care was put into kind of attracting us and kind of looking for us. And I mean, I would never have thought of working at Land O'Lakes, um, but but they found me. And so I think it's, it's about, you know, again, to Keith's point, avoid the usual channels, um, be very specific about the language that you're using to attract that kind of talent. Um, and then again, the proof's gotta be in the pudding, you know, it, it, and, and, and to my way of thinking, it has been, but to see it then demonstrated, um, and I think that once you then you build on it, so I, you know, I'm now, <laughs> let's bring more people like me in because I like that kind of environment. So with this next, comment and question is for you and this harkens back to something that you mentioned yesterday when we were chatting um, one uh, during the conversations on YouTube somebody says that they want you to be their mom <laughs> <laughs> so I said that yesterday that a lot of the millennial followers want her to be their mom so someone said that but the question is um, as you expand your business um, are there new social platforms that you're considering and are there some that you're just staying away from oh that's so interesting so um, 
On my website, most of my demographic is my age, and on Instagram, it's mostly millennials, which is why the mom comment. <laughs> um, new platforms. Um, this is the challenge, is that there's trying to keep up. I have two teenage sons, so they help me keep up. I tried <laughs> Snapchat for half a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and luckily, Instagram sort of adopted all of the snap, all the things that were appealing about Snapchat. So um, there aren't any that I'm avoiding. Um, I would say, uh, not that it's a new platform, but that YouTube video reigns supreme in my world. Um, everybody, everybody from these tasty videos um, which are just these sort of fast-paced, quick, not really tutorials, but kind of tutorials. They just are like these stimulants. They're not really teaching anybody anything. That might be one, I may live to regret this, but that may be one I'll avoid, just because it's not, my um, focus on, is on education, is on really empowering people to have the courage to do something like this. On Easter, there were over a hundred of these posted on Instagram from people making them for Easter. These are non-bakers, just plowed into it, felt encouraged to do it. So YouTube is a longer format, which is more suited to me. So that's probably the thing, unless there's a new thing, but YouTube is sort of the the mountain to pass. Any questions from the audience? All right, great, great presentations. Um, uh, my question is, I work in an environment with a lot of established creatives, or the creative team that I work on has been around a very long time even in, in the creative world. And as the leader of that team, I sometimes have a hard time, just we can't necessarily always go find new team members, or when I do, I try to fish in new ponds. Um, but what do you do to maybe re-engage some people who have, uh, they have great institutional knowledge, but that can also bring with it longer memories of, of difficult situations that can taint their, but did you do anything to re-engage people who've been around a long time and who still have really great things to add? You just have to sometimes pull them out of them in a different way. Yeah, there's, I maybe could jump on that one. There's a lot of, yeah. So there are elements of the uh, mental health um, that, that Annie was alluding to, which I absolutely 100% believe form part of that answer. Um, I call it creative PTSD. A lot of us have grown up being beaten. Like a lot of us have grown up being told it's not good enough, it's not good enough, it's not good enough. A lot of what we've spoken about today. And so that can build incredible anxiety and frustration and just like any animal, that manifests in different ways for different people. Um, history has proven it to, to, certainly in the creative world, to manifest in very self-destructive ways. But you can get past this. There's lots of hand-holding, there's lots of resetting of their understanding of uh, and, and what a safe space is. So I think a safe place is a really important first step. So they can sort of get a chance to see the sun for a little while, understand that they're not going to lose their job because they got something wrong. We held to the fire to get it right every single time. So if you can take that first step so they can relax and go, okay, cool. Now let's start thinking about it. Um, there's absolutely training involved. There's coaching involved. There's all these things that great sports people, great entertainers, great anyone um, needs help with. And so that's part of it as well. And then it's really coming from the up, because that's just that team. Then there's the importance of the organization to be able to demonstrate its belief, not just an understanding, but its belief that what this group does is valuable because no one likes to be devalued. Um, we have a friend from the HR world in the, in the room here today and she would certainly tell you, I hope, that undervalued, being feeling undervalued is one of the main reasons people leave their jobs before salary, right? Oh, I don't feel like I'm worthy. I don't feel like anyone cares what I do. These are big hurdles to get over, but you can get over them. It doesn't happen overnight. This is a slow burn. Um, there are most definitely what, and, and Matt would allude to, the 12th juror. There are people who are never going to get there, who are going to continue to be curmudgeonly <laughs> and, and old school creative. You've got to make some tough decisions as well. Heath, I would add to that. I think 
keeping it fresh, right, yep. which is essentially what you're asking about, is really hard when your job is to keep it fresh all the time, right? <laughs> like if that's, if it's like, you know, come up with new ideas, you know, and it's like, oh, by the way, um, please go out and hit a home run today. Okay, great. Oh, we'll see you tomorrow. tomorrow. Go out and hit a home run. You know, after a few years of that, you're like, it's hard to hit a home run every day, right? So you can get kind of jaded, you can get cynical in that space. But I mean, uh, you know, I tend to look at, so that's where you're gonna look at someone like Miles Davis, who essentially said, I'm really known for hitting home runs in this way, or Bob Dylan, right? And certainly, kind of, I'm gonna go over here. And so sometimes the organization needs to help the individuals shift. You know, it might be as simple as, hey, guess what? We're going to move everybody's chairs and desks in the office, and now you're not going to sit where you sat for the last. If you've been sitting in the same desk area for three or four years, things have calcified. Shift the desks around, right, so that they just have a different perspective. Or, or think about the way that you brief that team. It's like, have you been briefing them the exact same way with the exact same structure and format? Break it up. Like, guess what? No more paper for the briefing. Instead, we're going to do it here, or we're going to do it at the museum, or we're going to watch a movie together. Um, so the organization has to find ways of changing itself to sort of help that team. It, when you have creative people, and they've been doing something for a really long time, and then you, you're like, gosh, they're getting kind of stale, it, it's no wonder, right? It's, it's hard, but it's, in, it's inherent for the or it's in, it's required for the organization to shift and change itself yeah. to yeah. support yeah. that yeah. team. I'd, I'd also throw one last thing in I think is really important, that is force the organization to get to know each other. Yeah. Like there is no better way for a great team to start to work together like a real team than understanding, not just knowing who someone's kid's name is and what football team, understand where I come from. When you've got personal context around why someone's thinking that way, we don't go to the lizard brain and go, oh, it's typical creative, like, right. oh, it's head in the clouds, or you haven't given me enough time again, because as a creative person, I'm, I'm fully understanding that you've got pressure too. We're in this fight together. We do this thing together. So force people to get to know one another. It might be changing desks. It might be functions together. It might be beers on a Friday. Like, who knows what it is, but ways to, to there's multiple ways of doing that. Well, you know, when you first asked that question, sorry to interrupt, I was just going to add to that. I, I thought, oh, I, I don't even know how I'd respond to that. But then I thought, we had that exact same issue with chefs that come to us mm -hmm. that had been, you know, we, we've gone through this culture of the Gordon Ramsays. We were living in London as he was on the meteoric rise and the yelling and the screaming phase of his, I don't know, does he yell and scream anymore? But I just remember thinking, like, that's abuse. Like, mm -hmm. I can't, yeah. that mm -hmm. is verbal abuse. Yeah. I mean, the and, advertising industry was full of this. Well, and yeah. I, I think about, again, there's so much of this cultural shift that's needing to happen, not just in the legal world, the creative world, the, the chefing world. But again, what we're finding is that exactly that. People have been so damaged by other organizations, whether it's mentally, physically, or both that they come to Lynn Hall, and going back to what you said earlier about a safe place, that's a big piece of what we have to show up and show them and just continue to kind of reestablish that trust because they can't even access the creative part of their brain when they are still living in that lizard part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, that's, mean, I just never yeah. realized again how damaged this industry is, and I don't say that to be overly dramatic. I say it that every day I am seeing it. Yeah. And and it's every day I'm being reminded in safety. What does that look like? Just like, what does creativity look like? Yeah. And I, I, again, I lean back on a lot of my mentors. Well, safety to a lot of people is a consist something as simple as a consistent schedule. Something as simple as you said one thing, now I'm gonna test you and see, are you really gonna do it? Yeah. Because my last employers have shown me that I was gonna work 60 hours, but really they had me working 100. Yeah. And I was mm -hmm. you know, on a contract, so it's not like I was getting paid overtime and they just, they used me over and over and over again. Yeah. And I think there's a big responsibility that we have as employers in this day and age to really constantly evaluate how are we making our employees feel? Yeah. And do they feel yeah. safe? This is a huge question. I mean, <laughs> it's a big question. I'll throw one last 30 second thing in. Um, education on both sides of the fence. P creatives, air quote, creatives, they need to learn about business and they need to understand, get a grip of some realities 
that, and that's just why it's just called the business of creativity, not the creative business. They're two very different things, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> really different things. One is, whatever, I'll just do what I want because I want to do what I want. The other is, there are constraints here. There are realities of our environment that we have to function in, mm. whether it's time pressures, whether it's plate value, whatever the story is. Um, at the same time, you know, people on the other side of the fence have to get a little bit of that knowledge as well. So. Mm. So, we are out of time. Thanks for the question. If there are any other questions... Pavlova um, time. Pa it's Pavlova time. <laughs> this looks delicious. I'm sorry for those of you that are watching online. Um, I promise you it'll be delicious. Um, any other questions, forward them through to us. Um, I think we still have facility to be able to put questions online or email them through. Thank you, everyone, for being part of this. Thank you, team, for sharing your time with us. It's not just this one hour, hour or so. It's the, it's the day or so and time leading before this. So I appreciate the help. Thanks for everyone in the room, everyone online. Uh, and we'll catch you when we share another point of view next time. Thanks. Yeah.